early on in this series of talks on the Emmaus Road, I introduced you to Plato. Actually, Luke's use of Plato. And I propose that at the end of the Gospel of Luke, we actually find the introduction of Plato's Symposium, one of the best known philosophical books throughout the Greco-Roman world. It was written four centuries before the events of the Emmaus Road. And in Plato's telling of the story, two disciples are walking a long dusty road on a bright spring afternoon. One of them has a name. The other one is completely unknown, never identified, and never spoken of again. Just as in Luke 24. As these two men walk, they talk. A fellow traveler overtakes them on the road. He opens their hearts and minds of his fellow travelers as they arrive ultimately at a dinner party, but the stranger disappears before the first course is served, just as in Luke. Plato's main character, however, is not Jesus, it is Socrates. And Luke adapts that story not to plagiarize it, but to use it as a means to tell his own story about Jesus. He is using images, language, metaphors he and his audience were already intimately familiar with. Luke's creative adaptation has been there all along, even if we were unaware of it giving our cultural, linguistic, and historical distance from him. Well, I don't think Luke is done with Plato. If he co-ops the symposium at the beginning of the walk to Emmaus, he commits absolute copyright infringement once again at the end of the road. It appears to me that Luke incorporates the most famous allegory Plato ever put to paper. Again, some 400 years before Jesus. It is the allegory of the cave. A thought exercise proposed by Plato's mentor and teacher, Socrates. Socrates says this, imagine a group of people are held captive in a cave. Their backs are set against the stone. Their arms and their legs are chained to the ground. Their heads are locked with vices so they cannot turn their necks or cast their eyes in any direction but straight ahead toward a towering slick wall. Now for us, we might imagine it this way. Imagine a group of people chained in theater seats, forced to look directly at the screen. What is playing on that screen? Shadows. You see, behind these captives, there is a great burning fire. And this fire casts shadows of the outside world onto the wall. And those inside the cave talk about seeing trees and people and horses and farm animals. But they aren't seeing those things at all. They are only seeing the shadows. That's all they have ever known. And again, for those of us who can imagine patrons shackled to movie theater seats, they only see shadow puppets on the wall. Now, one of these captives somehow gets free. He immediately turns and looks behind him into the glowing light of the roaring fire. And he is blinded by it. But shortly thereafter, he is enlightened. He sees the mouth of the cave. He crawls out of the cave. He exits to discover everything that is real. Real trees, not shadows of trees. Real people, not shadows of people. Real farm animals, real horses, real chariots that up to this point he now understands had only been shadows. And finally he is able even to lift his head to look into the big, broad, incredible world around him to see green grass, blue skies, and this magnificent, bright, shining sun giving life to everything hanging there in the sky. He is left with one option, to return to the cave and to tell others about his discovery, to tell others 
that there is this unimaginable world right outside their door. There beyond the burning fire. But when he returns to share this message, he is regarded as a lunatic who has lost his mind. You can see instantly, if you've been paying any attention over these last few weeks, the parallels to Luke 24. This too has been a journey of blinding enlightenment. A coming out of the dark and into the light for the disciples of Jesus. You might remember that the name Cleopas is a metaphor. It means vision of glory. And there has also been all of this burning, roaring fire. Emmaus, their destination all along means what burns beneath. An ingenious Luke can play on words. And then the disciples say it for themselves. Did our hearts not burn within us as we walked along the road? And then last week, these two travelers return to their friends and try to explain their experience their encounter with the risen Christ as men who had been dragged out of a cave and into the brilliant light. They are shocked and frightened and overwhelmed, but they are illuminated. Faith, life, is so much wider and wilder, so much larger, so much more incredible than they could have imagined previously. They had only been dealing with shadows and now they are dealing with what is real. And they sound like raving maniacs. To their friends who are still in the cave. Who are still seeing shadows. And I so admire Luke's creativity and his effort as a writer here. To layer this story with so many undertones and so much suggestion. Now I know that not everyone is into Plato. And that's cool. I mentioned Plato around my house. Everybody in my family, their eyes just glaze right over. So let me tell you a more folksy story that tells the same story. A frog lives in a well his entire life. It's safe. It's sound. He's not really curious about anything else. He gets a little sunshine at noontime. He's mostly in the dark, but he's a frog. One day, another frog somehow falls into this well. And the, 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 the frog whose well, this is his home, says, Oh, where did you come from? He said, Oh, I came from a world much bigger than this one. Are you telling me? That there's somewhere else bigger and better than this? Oh, yeah. And he starts talking about blue skies and bright sunshine and acres and acres of fresh water to swim around in. And how much better it is to be in the sun most of the day, not just for a few minutes at a time. Well, the frog listens to this and he really tries to stay interested. But he finally says to himself, of all the liars I have ever known, this is the worst and the most shameless one I have ever met in my life. Because he could not believe that a brighter, better, more magnificent place could exist beyond the boundaries that held him. We shouldn't judge the frog in the well too harshly. Because he can only speak about what he knows. Right? His world had been... One limited set of experiences. And if you fell into his world after living in a different place, a miraculous place by comparison, how could words ever describe to him the world that you came from? How do you describe mystery to someone who has only known concrete walls? How do you describe a sunset or the Milky Way or a butterfly to someone who has never seen one of these things? How do you describe the unknowable God to someone who doesn't even know that they are longing for God? How do you tell someone who is only familiar with corpses that a dead man came back to life? How do you share the light 
of the good news with those who are only accustomed to living in the shadows. That's where I left you last week. And I think I said something to the effect of let God do God's work in you and step back far enough to let God do God's work in others because you will never pry open someone else's heart. You will never experience Jesus for someone else. You will never force someone else's experiences to conform to yours. You will never open someone else's eyes. You will never drag somebody out of whatever beliefs you think there's, their erroneous beliefs are and drag them into the light. You can only walk your road and carry your humble message and leave the results to God. If you have truly seen the light, if you have passed from darkness into the daytime and the warmth of the sun, it is impossible, impossible to be arrogant or judgmental toward others who have not had such an experience. You can only go forward with humility and share what Christ has meant to you. And as you share, Jesus just might show up. Literally, not likely, but let's not sell him short. But genuinely, absolutely. How else can any of us describe our own walk of faith? Because the thing about being a Christian, if we just get right down to it, is that someone has encountered the living Christ. Well, I was sprinkled as a baby, and that makes me a Christian. I don't think so. Well, I prayed the sinner's prayer at youth group meetings nine times and got baptized every time thereafter, and that makes me a Christian. I don't think so. Well, I practice all the sacraments. I read my Bible every day. I go to church every Sunday. I have a cross in my social media profile picture. I've been slain in the spirit 84 and a half times. Well, all that's fine. All that's good if those practices and rituals and rites, if they assist you. But to be a Christian is to know Christ. To be shaped into the image of Christ. And I don't restrict that to a camp meeting, a big tent revival experience with hands clapping and fire and signs following. Some people have such an experience. Others don't. It's different for everyone. But it's potently real. And when you share and speak of your experiences, it invites Christ Himself to arrive. Jesus made the promise Himself. Wherever two or more are gathered in My name. What did He say? I'll be there. I will join that conversation. And I think that's exactly what we see in the text today. These disciples hurry back to Jerusalem. They go back into the cave, down into the well, as it were, where their friends still are, and they begin to share their story with fear and trembling. They're grasping for words, humility, honestly. And then, Jesus arrives. It's as if their speaking of Him invites Him To join them. Now we've been conditioned. Oppositely than that. In ancient Chinese. There was this. Hideous fearful warlord. Named Tao. And the Chinese had a saying. Mention Tao. And Tao will arrive. You got adapted into Eastern Europe. This way. Talk of the wolf. And the wolf will be at the door. And then in the UK. And in the U.S., it became a little bit different proverb. Speak of the devil, and the devil will show himself. We usually don't get the red or second half of that. Somebody just walks in and we say, well, speak of the devil. Right? 
That just means you were gossiping about them and they walked up on you. Don't give evil so much power. Because the opposite is true. Speak honestly and sincerely of the Christ. And Christ just might show up in some form or fashion. Meister Eckhart, a radical Catholic mystic from the Middle Ages, talked about how we can birth God into the world. And as an aside, Eckhart is a treasure. And someday I'm going to do a whole series of talks on him, his life, his spiritual practices that he advocated. He is at once both elementary simple and profoundly unspeakable. But to the point of birthing God into the world, here's what he says. We are all called to be the mother of God. How does that land on your ears? The Christ is always wishing to be born into the world. What good is it to me for the Creator to give birth to His Son if I do not also give birth to the Son in my time and place? He said we all operate as the womb of God. Bringing God's presence into the world. So when you share your Christ experience, you are creating an incubating environment where Christ comes in to that conversation. Verse 36 of our text again. And just, just as they were telling about it, it being the journey on the Emmaus Road and all that had happened, just as they were telling about it, Jesus Himself was suddenly standing there among them. The telling birthed Jesus into the room. And the unreal real revealed itself to everyone who was there. No arm twisting. No demands to put forward. No sacraments. No altar call. No finger pointing. No arguing. No Romans Road or the four spiritual laws. Or handing them a book and saying, you just have to read this. If you read this, you'll understand everything that I'm going through. No. There's none of that. The Mennonites and the Quakers have a term for it. They call it, I love this, non-violent evangelism. Where you respect the people that you're talking to. You respect them with the dignity that they are another human being with convictions and beliefs and a life experience that you don't have. And what you do is simply be with people and live out your own story of personal transformations. Speak of getting out of the cave you were in. Talk about the bigger, fulfilling life path that has opened up to you. But you speak with love and respect Honesty and humility, not coercion or emotional pressure. Back to Eckhart. You are incubating a place for God to be born. You know what an incubator is. Today it's a highly advanced technological marvel for babies born premature, for babies in some kind of physical trauma, for newborns with an infection or some kind of sickness. What does an incubator do? It provides warmth. It insulates the baby from all the noise that's going on in the outer world. Noise that they cannot yet stand. Incubators are safe, nurturing, nourishing spaces for the vulnerable. For tiny little humans so that they will eventually Breathe on their own, live on their own, and thrive on their own. What an image that is. It began some 150 years ago. A French doctor was visiting a zoo in Paris. He saw a warming box for baby chickens. And he was intrigued by this, so he had one of these little warming boxes built to hold a premature baby. And he called it a child hatchery. 
I don't know how that translates into the French, but a child hatchery. German doctors started building them. And they collected, and collected is a strange word here, but it's an accurate one. They collected premature infants that hospitals were sending home with their mothers to die. Because there was nothing that could be done for a premature child. If they couldn't do it on their own, they couldn't do it, they thought. So why go to so much trouble? Well, several years later, these doctors from Germany brought their new invention to the United States. And they didn't bring it to a hospital. They brought it here. To Brooklyn. To Coney Island. The amusement park. And they had this exhibit of preemies in these child hatcheries so that as many people as possible could come see how they work. Rows and rows of the untimely born up against the wall for the viewing and paying public to see. One summer, the incubator exhibit made $20,000. Patrons paying a dime at a time to see what were known at the time as carnival babies. And that's how they were treated. Like little freaks of nature. Medical professionals at the time said about these warming boxes, these hatcheries, that they are a waste of time and money as small newborns really don't have a chance. Why bother? Why bother? Today, 20% of babies born in this country spend time in an incubator in order to survive. I spent the first two months of my life in an incubator more than 50 years ago. My sister and I. And only as an adult did I learn how miraculous our survival was being as premature as we were. Two of my three sons spent some of their first days in an incubator. Or they may not be here today. Cindy's sister is a neonatal intensive care nurse in the Atlanta area, and she routinely holds premature newborns that fit inside the palm of her hand, and weeks later, they go home healthy and whole. I think of our own Emmy Stanfield, and I told her that she would be in my sermon today, Ricky and Jasmine's daughter, who is now quickly approaching adolescence, but who was the size of your smartphone when she was born 11 years ago. You see, if time is taken, if you are persistent and compassionate, if you make the effort to provide a warm, inviting, cultivating space, Christ might arrive and God might be born again in the born again. Life could flourish Potentiality could become reality. And those we think that are unreachable or unchangeable or irredeemable are none of those things. They are simply premature. They need time. They need proper care. They need an environment in which they can come to life. You won't have to drag anyone toward the fire. Their cold bones will feel it and they will get close to it. You won't have to force anyone out of their cave. The Spirit will draw them to the light. You won't have to convince anyone that they are only dealing with shadows. As you tell your story, God just might open the heart of someone else to the real. Real with a capital R. Real even for those who resist Real for those who are afraid. Real for those who doubt. At the end of the Emmaus Road, this room is filled with just such individuals. There are no believers in the immediate aftermath of the resurrection. Only skeptics, only jaded cynics, and yet something happens to them that changed them forever. And that something still happens today.